I, I'd like to welcome you all to Right Lock Farm. Uh, my name is Archie McIntyre, and I'm the executive director yeah, here. So I just wanted to welcome you briefly. Um, and this is our fourth uh, evening, uh, fourth speaker series of the year. We have two more coming up, which you'll hear about later on the season. Um, but we're very happy to have such a nice uh, turnout tonight. And as I've done in the past, I'd like to wonder um, who is coming to the farm for the first time tonight? Few people. Uh, I guess by default, that means that people who haven't raised their hand have been here already. Uh, but I want to welcome you, you newcomers to the farm and invite you back um, for our other events, but also to come and enjoy the farm on an informal basis. And of course, I want to welcome all of our uh, other supporters who uh, have come here before and enjoyed the fruits of Right Lock Farm. Uh, let me ask one more quick question. Um, who lives outside Winchester? Well, that's really <laughs> encouraging. Um, you know, we view a Right Lock Farm as a Winchester um, uh, farm, but we are realizing that uh, the farm has a lot of draw from surrounding towns, Arlington and Lexington and Cambridge and Medford and uh, Stoneham and lots of places. So we've, we're, we're really happy about that. Um, so uh, for those who are new to uh, the farm, um, our mission uh, is to build broad community through active learning, sustainable agriculture, uh, land stewardship on our historic New England farm. That's a pretty broad um, um, all encompassing set of missions, um, but this event like uh, falls well within a couple of those uh, areas. Um, and um, we try to do these things to uh, not only um, uh, learn more uh, about who we are, um, but also to have other people come and enjoy uh, knowledge they wouldn't necessarily get otherwise. Tonight, uh, we're happy to have Kathy uh, Stanton here, and um, I wanted to show you one of our favorite items here at the farm. Uh, I bet a lot of you have this t-shirt, which is our chicken. Um, on, on the back of the t-shirt, we have a little saying, hold that up, Kim, a little saying saying, local food since 1638. <laughs> and that, that's kind of our little buzz line. Um, and, you know, it's pretty cute, isn't it? Uh, 1638, I guess, is when, they, when this land was first occupied by the white man. Uh, we don't really know that much about our history. Um, we know a lot of things by anecdote, um, but um, history can be kind of obtuse for uh, us lay people. So tonight is really going to be um, fascinating and interesting to me to start learning about the history of the farm and how to learn about histories mm -hmm. of farms. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna introduce Kim Nealon, who is our community engagement manager and development associate, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Archie, and thank you all for coming this evening. Um, just great to see again another lively, um, Full barn for a great evening of learning. But now to turn our attention to Kathy, I'm going to give her a little introduction. Um, she is coming from a, to us from Wendell, Massachusetts today. She started her career with an interest in American history, which took her on a path that eventually landed her at Tufts University, both for um, school. She has a PhD uh, through there, but she is now also uh, currently an anthropology professor. Um, her published works focus largely on the uses of history, heritage, and culture in redevelopment projects. She's done a lot of work in Lowell, um, for instance, looking at their industrial history and their current efforts to reinvigorate the city. Um, as an engaged scholar, she has served as a consultant to the U.S. National Park Service and, uh, ethno Ethnography Program, there we go, for more than 15 years producing a number of peer-reviewed studies of military reenactments, farming, and uh, ethnic avocational and seasonal communities associated with national parks. More recently, she has been investigating how we might create 
a less energy intensive growth oriented society, which has led her to explore the convergence of historic sites uh, like ours and the contemporary food systems. Last year, she also published a book she co-authored with Michelle Moon uh, called Public History and the Food Movement, Adding the Missing Ingredient. Every time I've spoken with Kathy in the past year, I've walked away with new perspectives of right lock and better insights of how we fit into the food movement. And I'm so excited for her to share her knowledge with you tonight. So please join me in welcoming her to the barn stage. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Kim. Thank you, Archie. And, and thanks for inviting me to be here. This has been such a treat. And, and I... Um, I want to start with a disclaimer, which is that I'm just in a lot of ways beginning to learn about Right Lock Farm, although I've been thinking about farm history for quite a number of years and thinking particularly about how farm history and museums and historic sites, which is what I study and I'm interested in, how that can link up with our efforts to make a stronger, more resilient, more local, more just food system, which sort of two big important things that don't quite touch yet. And so, and yet I think they can and they can really inform each other in really important ways. So that's kind of my, my project. Um, and I'm really excited to be here just because, and I'll talk about this all the way through, but why this is such a fantastic site to, um, to be having this kind of conversation and to be um, thinking about these kinds of uses of history. Um, so I'm not thinking about sort of a simplistic, how do we just kind of reach into the past and pull out a lesson that we can use? Because Sometimes we think that's what history is good for, and it, it actually isn't. It tends to be um, more complex than that and less sort of straightforward, um, but an incredibly valuable tool for understanding how we got to a particular place. And I think also inspiring and um, enlightening and kind of broadening our, our range of vision of how, wh where we might go from here, just kind of informing us in some ways as kind of a reality check. Um, in some ways to find out what people have tried to do before, um, which either worked or, or didn't work and maybe why, but also just kind of what we're up against, what we're, what we're facing, what we're trying to do. Um, it's very challenging. Farming is always very challenging. Uh, running a historic site is always very challenging. <laughs> running a farm historic site is, is sort of triply challenging. Um, and yet I think history can really kind of enrich um, the sense of what the of mission of that is here. Um, and it's in some ways what I'm trying to do is just shed some light, really, sort of to, to see New England farming history more clearly. And there's some very big barriers to doing that, some surprising barriers. Surprising because we think of New England as a very historic place and New England farms. We, we kind of have a sense of you know, what historic New England places are. But that's a somewhat uh, deceptive history in a lot of ways. So, I mean, first of all, most of us today looking back at New England farming, aren't, we aren't farmers ourselves, let alone people trying to farm commercially, which is a whole different thing from just, you know, kind of growing some vegetables. Um, and it's arguably a lot of New England farms have never kind of fit the mold of kind of the classic American farm. We kind of think that they do, but that's been shaped in a lot of ways by kind of Midwestern farms, the big grain field with the barn and the silo. And, uh, you know, so New England farms are kind of hard to see in comparison to that. Um, and then there's been this very long history of New Englanders getting all nostalgic and kind of laying on layers of uh, romanticism about their farms. And so that kind of obscures um, our sense of what real farming was like and kind of what the issues were. So it's a kind of a fascinating, shifty, uh, layered kind of history. That, and it's fascinating to look at those layers in themselves and kind of how they have shaped our perceptions. So. Um, so what I've been trying to do is kind of bring together a big timeline for thinking about American farming in general and global farming at this point. You can't really draw lines you know, around national food systems often. Um, but then to put it in really close dialogue with the histories of very specific farms, so kind of the micro and the macro to bring those together. And right lock is just this treasure that lets us do that and do some really specific things that's very hard to do other places just because of where it is. It's in the suburbs. It's so, it's so close to the city. And, and there are, you know, there's a few little historic farms in, in cities, but, you know, suburban farms like this, the land pressures have been so intense. It's very, very unusual to, to have a site like that, have 20 acres of, you know, that, like we've got out here. So it's, it's really um, a joy to be um, sort of looking at that. 
So thank you for including me in the, in the series. And um, as I say, I want to make this disclaimer that this, uh, my expertise is not so much the history of this farm yet, although I'm beginning to um, enjoy the, you know, getting into that dialogue, but, but more thinking about this question of how can we use history as a tool and an inspiration at a, at a site like this one. Um, so what I'd like to do is actually structure this talk around the three moments that are on the, um, that little homework sheet that I handed out. So um, with luck, everybody got one. If you didn't, we'll, we'll go through it on the slides as well. So and I, to, to really think about these three moments that I think um, can illuminate something important about the food system and food system history, but then kind of think about why this farm is such an exceptional site for um, in, engaging in, you know, thinking about those moments and these, these sort of pivotal changes that were happening um, against that timeline. So the first one was that question, that. Okay. Um, is the question of when did there, basically when did New England start to run out of ample prime farmland for everybody who wanted a farm? Um, and just let's just do a poll here because one of the interesting things is again what, how, what we a sense that we have like we, we kind of sense that we know some things about New England farm history but it's interesting to pry into that a little bit so how many people would have put it somewhere kind of in that first half of the 19th century 800 to 1850 several yeah good um, anybody put it in that later kind of middle to later so maybe a Few more, about the same, a few more, okay. Anybody into the 20th century? A few people, okay, thinking 20th. Um, later than that, anybody? Okay, so some people are still thinking later. Yeah. Did anybody go that early? Okay. So somewhere in your family history, there were f farmers who couldn't find enough land. But it was that early. It was actually earlier than that. So this, I, like I started with the American Revolution, but it's even earlier than that. It's sort of crazy early. Um, so by the time of the revolution, already, there weren't enough good farms. There was land, but not prime farm land, not the kind of farm you could just sort of, you know, clear some trees and, and run a plow. It, it was, it was um, people were starting to move out of places like Boston, like eastern Massachusetts, and go into the upland towns like Wendell, which is where I live, it's out near Greenfield, um, places like um, Peter Sam, and has anybody ever been to Peter Sam, the, the Harvard Forest out there? Yeah, they have a very famous set of uh, these dioramas. They're some of the so the sort of best tools for picturing what um, old, you know, what, what farming has looked like over time. Although there's <clears throat> there's also some questions about how accurate they are. But um, <clears throat> but this is you know this is the 1730s. He's clearing a farm in Petersham. This is not prime farmland. This is up in the hills. You, you can see it's not in a um, you know in the river bottoms. The the so the land that had the, the the good land, the land that the natives had been farming, which is important to know. Like indigenous people were farming before. Uh, colonials got here, but they were farming the river bottom lands. So the you know the Great Meadow in Concord and the uh, Connecticut River Valley, and that's that's where that's, that was the obvious farmland. But by the time of the Revolution, the obvious farmland was already gone um, and and spoken for. People were having large families. You had seven sons. They all wanted their own farm. They moved to Petersham or Vermont or Maine or you know kind of farther and farther out and up. So up into these um, kind of hilly farms, kind of upland farms, um, and it's just the logic of population growth um, and in that kind of settler society. And these farmers were also they weren't just looking for land, but they were looking for growth. They were looking for economic growth because they were. Uh, they were, that's why a lot of them were here. They were, they were trying to prosper and you know kind of move on. And so you get this um, this connection with Wright Lock and the, the first owner here, Philemon Wright, who uh, took off for Canada, which is another frontier. We think of the West as the frontier, but Canada a lot of land up there and a lot of really good farmland. And Philemon Wright um, sort of moved moved up to uh, what's around the Ottawa region. So in, in uh, he went to Montreal and, and then over to Ottawa, but um, to explore the country, being determined to change my residence into Canada, having a large family to provide for. He had nine kids, and that was the idea. Like, if they were all going to inherit and move on, they, they had to go somewhere where there was more land. Um, so he eventually owned 38,000 acres, so he did, he did that pretty well. Um, he owned a lot of Ottawa and Hull, which is across the river, and built taverns and, and mills and um, and really settled, he was like the founding settler up there. Um, why this matters a lot in the terms of thinking about New England history is that this, this sense of people leaving because they couldn't find enough land or couldn't facilitate enough growth 
really contributed to the sense that New England farmland wasn't worth much. And that's a, that's a very deep-seated kind of sense that we had. Like New England farmland, eh, it's, it was poor farmland. People had to go somewhere else if they wanted to farm. Actually, New England farmland, even in the upland places, there's some fantastic farms for, for pasture, for grazing, um, even for, for crops in some places. Um, but acre for acre, New England farmland is actually still as productive, the good farmland, as any farmland in the country. Um, and some of it even better. Like we've got some of the best soils in the world. It's just small. We just don't have as much of it. The, the scale is smaller. And as the society expanded and people's expectations were big, it, what, it, it had this sort of sense of limits that people didn't want to be bound by, and that's, which is a really important point, I think. So this is a quote that you sometimes hear people talking about New England farmland, um, and it's, a, it's like an old saw, you know, kind of an old thing that and um, various people have sort of famously quoted, you know, nature out of her boundless store threw rocks together and did no more. That's it. That's New England farmland. You know? And I, you know, I, I live in a place that you know, when you dig a hole, you get more rocks out of the hole than the size of the hole. So I, I get, you know, there's a lot of rocks in New England. But um, that was also land that was overworked, overgrazed, eroded um, it was, it, by farmers who were trying to keep up with you know, this pressure of growth and um, that they, they were not using the land um, as, as well as we, we now would say they might. Um, and this is still a story that, um, that we still hear. So if you've ever been down to the Boston Public Market or maybe you've seen these things other places, but this company called American Stonecraft, this is genius. So they, they get rocks that, and it's not stone walls, they're not taking the walls apart, it's just the rocks that come up in the soil through frost heaves. And they slice them and they make very high end, like platters and bowls and um, coasters and things. They're beautiful and they're all, they all have a farm name on the bottom of them. They're quite expensive. Um, but this is, when you look at this, I mean, they're, they're totally replicating that, um, that older idea about New England farms. You know, we, we come from a place so rocky that rocks grow. And by grow, they mean they heave up in the, um, in the spring. Um, but you know, farmers battling rocks left ancient ruins as testament, you know, kind of man versus nature. Like the, the rocks were trying to beat us, and then you know, we had to go to Ohio to get away from them to, to get a decent farm. So that's a really deep-seated narrative about, um, about New England farming that is actually more complicated than it seems at first. It's not just about the soil. It's about what people were asking that soil to do and the time period, the sort of expansive early colonial period when, when there were these expectations being put on these farms that these particular farms, um, not all of them could, could meet. So it reminds us that all farming always takes place within ec um, ecological limits. Right? All, all farming does. But here we realize those limits sooner. And we could say that we're realizing them for all farming you know, on a global scale now. It's a really interesting way to use a site like this to say, you know, this is a cautionary tale from, from way back when that you can actually do really well on this farm. And we'll talk about how the locks did very, very well on this farm for a long time. Um, but you have to work with what the land is rather than demanding that it be something that it's not. Um, and I see this in you know, the part of the world where I live where people actually, there's some fantastically productive tiny hill farms growing on very you know, kind of old, supposedly tapped out land and you know, newer regenerative kinds of ways of thinking about agriculture. Um, are doing amazing things, but it's a really different relationship with the land than um, a lot of the, the colonials had. So, um, okay. So that's the that kind of that first point, that first moment, I th and I think it was a really important turning point. So the second one, um, this question of when did the region's overall agricultural production peak? So we're thinking about New England as a whole, and you know, measuring the, the output of the of the region as a whole. Um, and I won't do the little trick here. I'll actually start at the beginning. Okay. So how many people said back at the, around the time of the revolution? Okay. Nobody's picking that one. Um, first half of the 19th century, few people, yes, okay. So later half of the 19th century, majority, and that I think is kind of what I would say is kind of the, the common wisdom about it. Um, early 20th century, we have a few brave hands going up. Okay, good. And then later half of the 20th century, okay, one, one, okay, couple, couple, okay. Um, so it's actually, we can pinpoint this with real accuracy. It's 1910. 
Um, it's, you know, because they, it's like obsessive measuring of, of you know, crops and products. So it's actually very, um, very clear, but very understandable that we tend to think it's earlier. That's the decline narrative at work. It's like we have the sense that, you know, New England farming went downhill, that everybody moved to the frontier, the, you know, the big farms. We tend to think by the 19th century it was already going or gone. But it was increasing. It was literally increasing all the way into the 20th century. Um, and it did, it, it sloped off there, but, and we'll talk about sort of, you know, when the steeper slope was. But that's a really important, um, this, this moment is a really important moment in farming history nationally, regionally, obviously. Um, and there's great links with Right Lock Farm because, um, so that squash barn that's right out there, that amazing, you know, unique squash barn was built right around that time. Uh, a lot of the, you know, the equipment that we see here, and I'll show some, some pictures, but that that's, there's a lot going on on this farm um, and in Winchester in general right around that moment. It's a very busy time in New England agriculture. Not a moment of decline at all. It was still on the upswing. You know, as far as they knew, it was still, it was still kind of going up. Um, so just a couple of things about kind of where that um, decline narrative comes from. It's got a complicated kind of um, backstory. So... Um, part of it, actually, it had that narrative, that idea that, oh my God, New England is losing its farms and the soil is terrible and what, how are we going to save our agriculture? That actually goes way back to the, to the beginning of the 19th century. Um, partly because of the, the fighting between the sectional, uh, kind of the tension between North and South before the Civil War about whose system was better and which one was going to prevail. The North was losing population. People were moving because they were looking for, for more land. Um, there was this sense that the North had to be strong, and it was linked with soil. So this, you know, the Free Soil Party. It, it wasn't just called the Free Men Party. It was the Free Soil, and that, that idea that um, you certified that, new, that the North's mission was right and our, you know, that their way of life was right because the soil was free, and, and that if farming seemed to be in decline or seemed to be weakening, that weakened the argument. Um, you know, people were leaving because the soil somehow couldn't support um, the, the farming. So that was a part of the, um, the anxiety. Um, there was also, I mean, this was the time when industry is just surging and just, you know, kind of taking off. And so farming, by comparison, looked really pokey. It, it sort of, it looked, you know, it couldn't, you couldn't make the kind of profits that you could make with a factory. It was much more capital intensive. Um, it, you know, the, the, the industrial economy was the dot-com boom or the, you know, the, the internet boom. It was sexy. It was the thing that everybody was excited about and the profits could be fantastic. Farming, you, kind of, you know, you, you didn't make a killing in farming if you made any money at all. And so it seemed pokey. So that was, it was sort of a perception, like, it should get with the program. It should, they should modernize. They should, they should do more. They should, like, you know, kind of move along with the times. And not, farmers mostly didn't want to do that, uh, mostly because it was going to cost them more money or they were doing things the way they wanted to do them. So um, there was a, a perception of uh, farming falling behind. And, and linked with this sense that farms were being abandoned, they were, um, you know, they couldn't keep up. So this is the diorama from the Fisher Museum and the, the Harvard Forest showing in the 1850s. And very famous, you know, pictures of old stone walls running off into the forest, this reclaimed the farmland. And the idea that farms were just, you know, kind of falling by the wayside, which was really not true. Um, so, and partly it was this, you know, they just didn't look as competitive as the, the industry did. Partly it's because farmers at that point realized, you know what, stripping off all the trees and trying to grow sheep or trying to like ch chase the, you know, the golden ball of, of, of capitalism, of, of a capitalist economy, just was terrible for their farms. And so they actually were letting, you know, they'd let an upland pasture that had been stripped and maybe eroded go back to woodlot. And a lot of people looked at that and said, oh, that's terrible. That, that farm is abandoned. It's like, no, it's just, they're just growing the woodlot back. So, so a lot of that was non-farmers, and there were more non-farmers at that point, um, not knowing really what they were seeing um, and kind of misinterpreting it. And the state got involved, and, and this actually in three years, Massachusetts did these listings. They said, let's go out and find all the abandoned farms, and then the, let's find farmers and like sell those farms and get them back into production. And so they, they listed these. These are fascinating, and I've, I've gone through. It's town by town, and they have very detailed descriptions of, of farms. I've gone through for my town, just sort of curious, like where were these abandoned farms? Who abandoned them? 
they weren't all abandoned. <laughs> Some of them were, you know, somebody's father's farm and the father had died and it was like a way, it was like a real estate listing. It wasn't that the farm was abandoned. They were trying to find a, a buyer for it. And in the preface to this thing, it's actually very amusing. They, they, they describe their whole method of we're sending out these surveys to farmers and we're trying to find the abandoned farms. And, and then they're saying, well, the farmers wouldn't send the surveys back. So we sent it out again. And well, they still didn't send it back. So we sent out somebody to talk to them or we called them on the telephone. And they kept saying, no, it's fine. We don't need this. <laughs> Everything's OK. I'm not using that field now, but I think I will. You know, I'm just letting it go for a few years. And clearly, the farmers are saying, you know, it's fine. We're, it, it, it's OK. But the perception among state planners and economic developers was, you know, we've got a problem here we have to solve. Very different from the, the, the farmer's perception, which, again, at this time period was just like, that's OK. You know, things go up and down. It's farming. But, but, but we're OK. We don't have to hit the panic button. Um, and then the, the third thing that was happening was a lot of nostalgia. This is kind of when the, um, the real nostalgia for New England kicks in. So around the turn of the 20th century, um, the colonial revival we often talk about. The, um, and some of it was a kind of response to real shifting demographics and a lot of new immigrants and a lot of social changes, a lot of the changes that come with industrialism. So a lot of people really romanticizing good old New England, um, including old farms and, and you know, copying in their, their architecture and, and visiting on their vacations and um, you know, really, really kind of um, creating an image that is sort of based in reality, but not completely. Now, this is, Wallace Nutting was a um, photographer and a sort of a tastemaker um, around the turn of the 20th century. And I found a quote that goes with this. He said, not everything old was good, but everything new is bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? so that's, you know, that's that sense that, um, and that's an interesting quote. It's like not, we're not going to completely romanticize the past, but it was so much better than the present. Um, so really looking to the past for, um, for respite, for escape, for, you know, something better in that, in that sense. Um, and really what was happening was New England farmers were just readjusting their mixes, as I said. So um, their land use, their crops, their markets, um, and they were and remain very, very productive. So great connections here with, um, with Wrightlock, which just illustrates this moment in time really beautifully. And I, I think... Um, I, hmm? Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, it wasn't advancing, so I'm just... Yeah, thanks. Um, if I, I, I think that I, um, you know, if I were to point to something that this farm can do really superlatively well, I think it's to help us think about what was going on 100 years ago in New England farming, which is not, as I say, it's not the time period most people think of when they think of New England farms. We tend to go farther back than that. But this 100 years ago was just a really important and fascinating moment. So this is uh, 1931. This is a tad later, but you know, kind of that early 20th century. Um, but you can see, so right here's, this is why you were mentioning the clicker. Thank you. Um, so right left farm, it's right here. So here's um, Ridge Street going along here. There's the, the parking lot is basically here. Um, so 1931, so here especially, you know, what we think of as kind of the Wild West of Winchester, which you know, just stays very, very rural well into the, into the 20th century. Um, some of the roads that are there today were not even there at that point. Um, and if you look through, and I've just been doing this, look through the agricultural censuses um, and, and other materials that kind of show what they were actually growing, you can just see them continually adjusting and, you know, from one decade to the next, really adjusting their mix. So there was a lot of, um, a lot of market gardening, and that's what this you know, this farm became known for was really incredible market garden production. The wagons that are, you know, down in the alcoves back there were tr trucking stuff into Boston. And um, so industrial cities, growing cities, we tend to think of as, you know, eating up the farmland or superseding the agricultural economy. They were fantastic markets, right? they're, they're, you know, because those were people that weren't growing their own food. And so at, right all, all across the scale from little tiny industrial towns, mill towns to, to the big cities. They were, they were terrific markets. You had to be able to supply at a certain scale and in a certain way and deal with the transportation. So, and you, so you had to have a certain amount of capital and a, you know, an, an organization that could do that. Not every little kind of mom and pop farm stand could supply to a, you know, a wholesaler in Quincy market, but these guys really could. Um, 
Orchards were, you can see this in the censuses, you know, kind of expanding, disappearing, coming back. So here's the, um, the right lock orchard. You can always see the, that grid pattern that, um, that shows you that there are trees and you, there's still some trees up there. Um, and that's, you know, the fruit farms were, they kind of had a moment and then they, they kind of went away again. But that, so that's like, you know, it, that was fine until apples started coming in from the West Coast and then that didn't, didn't work, so we'd try something else. Um, small dairies, and I, I just looked in the in the 1880 census. Suddenly, there's several. There's four small dairies in um, Winchester that weren't there 10 years before. Tiny dairies, like four acres, nine cows, really little little plots of land um, with usually immigrants um, who are running them. Obviously, delivering home home delivery of milk, um, and then they'll disappear again. The, you know, the next year they kind of come and go, but. Um, so, and those people, they didn't have much land, but they had cows. I think they must have been buying hay from the larger farms, like, like this one. This farm made a lot of hay. So you get this sort of ecosystem where the farmers are buying from each other and selling in, in all kinds of different ways. And then specialized market crops. And that's, again, this, this, there's nothing better than this farm because we had the Blue Hubbard squash, which, um, which is like there. They identified that as their their specialized niche that, um, that they were going to really um, emphasize. So the squash house was, um, Sally says, not built but expanded, right? This is, yeah. So there was something there before. Yeah. So, yeah. It was, there was a squash house there, but then this one was obviously renovated and, and expanded so somewhere be before 1918. Yep. 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 Um, so there's the squash house. There's their Packard delivery truck, amazing truck and all the, um, the, the uh, wooden crates with the carefully packed squash, um, you know, tons and tons and tons of squash going downtown. Um, so that's that, you know, that, that era, very, very high end, um, fairly capital intensive, but to, you know, state of the art, absolutely state of the art, all the way across the board, the building, the, um, the way of marketing, the, the vehicle, very fancy vehicle. This is not just a, like a wagon. Um, and then another, th and so I just, um, Partly this is just to kind of show you the, the way you kind of pull little tidbits out of historical documents, primary documents, which is you get little sort of odds and ends and piece them together. So this is um, these handwritten notes in the agricultural census for 1880 for Winchester. I've never seen this before in the ag census. I think they probably weren't supposed to be writing you know, handwritten notes. That's usually not. They, they've got a form. You're supposed to fill out the form. But this guy is writing all these little notes, which is, you know, bless him. It's great because usually you wonder, why did they do this? And I wonder if this is that. And he's, he's writing these little notes that actually tell you if you can decipher his handwriting. So, so this farm, and Charlene, you said this is where you live, is the Hutchison farm. That's great. Um, so it says it's what's called a pickle farm. Combining agriculture and manufacture, it's a very, you know, kind of of the moment um, thing. It's not agriculture or industry, but both together. Mr. H sells a thousand barrels of small cucumbers at $10, $10 for a barrel, partly produce of his and mostly of other farmers. So it's amazing little insight into this, um, you know, kind of this ecosystem, this, this adjustment, the innovation that was, was going on. He's found a new product. He's sourcing from his neighbors. He's, you know, he's, he's selling um, something that wasn't being sold before. And then the piggeries are another, um, another thing. So they weren't there before. People used to have like one or two pigs, and it was mostly for family use. Um, and then all of a sudden, in so 1870, 1880, you're getting somebody's got 150 pigs. Somebody's got 300 pigs. It's like, that's a lot more pigs. <laughs> so that was, um, I, again, that was a sort of a specialized market. It wasn't for pork, which is interesting. It was to sell the piglets. So they're selling um, little, you know, squealers, they're squealing pigs, they call them, and suckling pigs, um, to other farmers, presumably, or to people in cities. I, and that I don't know, like, where, where those were being sold, but it was like a nursery. And so there were several farms in, um, in Winchester that were doing that. And um, Charlene shared with me this great interview from 1980 from a fellow who'd grown up many decades before, and he was talking about the, <clears throat> the piggeries and, as something that he remembered. They'd, they'd had 300 pigs on his, um, his farm. So um, again, scratchy little note that you have to sort of decipher like, what's going on. You don't have to read it. <laughs> but, but that's the, you know, this is this, these little treasures that you find kind of in the margins. So I'll let you just kind of read that. So number six is in the, um, the you know, line number six in the census. So. Thank <laughs> you. 
And this is very fascinating to me because it really, it's showing you the cycling, what we now talk about is cycling of nutrients. I mean, they talked about that then, but the idea that you're not, you're not wasting stuff, you're cycling it through the people, the soil, the pigs, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and kind of creating these loops of, um, you know, making use of, so swill, and when they're talking about swill here, they mean what we now think of as compost, right? or, you know, this is stuff that would be waste, but so the market gardeners are buying that stuff, which is gathered in city carts by the authorities, so the city is collecting what we now say is compost, um, food, food waste, and then brought and carried to the farmers keeping piggeries, so they feed the, the compost to the pigs, who then poop and fertilize the fields for the garden. So overall, in this time period, it's like farming is still very, very viable. It's, it's vibrant, um, and because we don't have supermarkets yet. So, and that absolutely mirrors the national trend. So there's this sort of brief, people talk about it as the golden age of American farming, this the early first couple of decades of the 20th century, which is this sort of brief moment of balance when you could still have a fairly small scale farm and be a player in the kind of the real food economy. You could, you could do it for a number of kind of converging reasons. So one is, um, you know, you could, fossil fuels had come along, but they hadn't completely kind of taken over everything yet. So if you had the money to buy yourself a truck or a tractor, you know, tractors which came along exactly this time period too, you, um, you could farm much more efficiently and do a lot more, um, which is good because labor was getting to be, you know, kind of harder to come by. So you could, you could farm more with uh, fewer people, um, more, more efficiently and less backbreaking labor in a lot of ways. Um, and, um, but you weren't suffering because there wasn't a, um, you know, a food economy dominated by long distance trucking and apples that were coming from, from Washington yet. Um, so people talk about this as the era of parity, um, that farmers actually could make a living that was comparable to another, you know, a professional living or like a, you could make a good living just, just running a farm. Um, and World War I was a big boon for, the, they were provisioning the troops, the European markets weren't producing, so that was actually kind of the peak. It coasted right through until after the end of World War I, and at that point, um, then it really started to fall apart. So the end of World War I was, for farmers, was really the start of the Great Depression. In 19, kind of 1920. Farmers, farmers hit the Great Depression much earlier than the rest of the country. So at that point, um, then when everybody started having a tractor and a truck, um, and the, the really big guys started being able to consolidate and buy bigger tractors and more land and you know, kind of kick in these efficiencies of scale and economies of scale that we still are seeing getting larger and larger. Um, a lot of consolidation, a lot of um, you know, kind of merging of things, mon monopolization in various ways. And, and the technologies were getting more expensive. So it, you know, it wasn't just a little tractor. You needed like a bigger tractor or you know, th things that were costing more and more money. You needed a silo for silage. That became the, you know, you couldn't just dairy in the winter. You needed to dairy year round if you were going to be competitive. And then you needed a barn with a silo and, and maybe a milking machine. And, then you might need electricity for your milking machine. You know, it, it just sort of went on and on. And we, that's the, the treadmill that farmers are still on that they're trying to chase. So now we need a $400,000 combine to, to harvest if you're going to you know, harvest your 10,000 acres and, and kind of stay in the game. So um, that's really when that, that the cycle started before that arguably 100 years before that, but um, it didn't become a real crunch for farmers until uh, this, right after World War I. So, um, and especially with farm, smaller farms, so they're getting knocked off, you know, kind of more and more as, as time goes along. This, this farm, because it did, it was, a, it was a prosperous farm and they had resources and then they were able to, you know, kind of keep building on that. So, um, but this is an incredibly important kind of pivotal decade, this in the 19 teens. And I think in some ways it's almost what we're trying to get back to, you know, kind of that, that moment of where you could, um, you know, you could, so this is, this picture, um, which we look at and sort of say, oh, old timey New England, this was actually taken in the 1950s. He's, so this is right lock, you know, so, you know, decades after they've got this monster thing, <laughs> then they're going downtown with that, they're still using the horse and wagon. Farmers are very frugal. They're not, you know, they're not 
profligate. They're not using the fanciest technology just because it's cool. They're using the best tool for the job. And if the best tool is still the old horse and wagon, they'll, they'll use that too. So what we think of now is a kind of a hybrid system. It's very, quite efficient. You know, you use the fancy expensive tool for the thing that is going to let you stay competitive, but be, be frugal with the, the rest of it. Um, and that, that's what I think is, you know, we're in some ways trying to reach back toward is that, that sense of some kind of a, a workable balance that doesn't half kill the farmer. Like they, you know, they, they get some, some muscle, some mechanized muscle help, but, um, but they also are not just um, chasing the, you know, kind of that receding edge of the, the fossil fuel uh, economy. All right. So let's do the last point, um, and then we'll, we'll sort of get into just some, some talk. Um, so when did chain supermarkets become the way that most people in New England got most of their food? So um, let's see. OK, so I just gave that away. <laughs> um, how, but let's be honest. <laughs> how, how, just let's give me some. Some guesses here, like what, what are some of the things that you get? 1970, 50, 60, 65, very specific, okay. So 1950s, 60s, 70s, did anybody go earlier than 50s? Anybody go early 60s? Yep, okay. Anybody go later than 1970s? Yeah, you're, you're right. That's good. <laughs> so, and there's my little giveaway. So yeah, right, right in there. Um, and that's just... Um, you, and it's, it's an interesting question because you know, we'll just look at, you know, supermarkets have actually been around longer than we tend to think. Um, but that is definitely the, you know, sort of that tipping point. And it's also exactly when that last generation of locks was farming this farm. Um, and this is, there's still sort of debate about who all they are. I think the portly fellow is George Locke. That's my guess. Um, and then these are five of his several sons. Um, two of whom carried on, Chester and Wendell carried on as kind of the older farmers. So that generation, when you look at them, they all start out as farmers. You look in the census, they're all working on the farm, but then gradually they kind of peel off and do other things. One becomes a bank clerk and one becomes a house painter and they're, they're you know, kind of moving away and doing other things. So George Sr. died in 1921 um, and the, these Chester and Wendell kept farming here, but by 1958 they're fairly elderly. And in 1958, so they formed a family trust and voted to subdivide the land um, and develop some of it and kept the, you know, this core, which miraculously is, is still here. Um, and so in 1964, Chester, who was the remaining brother, deeded the, the remaining farmland to the Hamiltons, who planted all the, put in the, the raspberry, the pick your own raspberries. So there's that incredible continuity. It, you know, there really is not a gap that, that it goes on being farmed. Um, but the, this question of supermarkets, kind of putting supermarkets into this history, I think is really important. You come to a place like this and it seems like a million miles from a supermarket. In fact, that's why we come to a place like this, right? <laughs> to get away from the supermarket, maybe, and the, the bright lights. So, um, and I was doing a project um, three years ago now, and you can find the, the book from it at the back, um, called Farm Values, and just thinking about how can we tell these little stories about farms. And... I kept stubbing my toes on, you know, farmers sort of telling me about how they'd had to stop because they couldn't sell to the supermarket or the supermarket came in. And I, I had been thinking, oh, far farms have history, but supermarkets don't have history. They're just supermarkets. <laughs> of course they have history. Um, and the fact that we, we think of farms as being historic or old or archaic or, you know, kind of obsolete is largely because we have supermarkets, really. You know, the, the, and, and in some ways they are exactly two sides of the same story. So I started looking at supermarkets and kind of inserting supermarkets into this story, even though in some ways we may not want to. It's more interesting to think about a beautiful farm than, you know, kind of the aisles of the stop and shop. But, um, but it's, I think it's um, a really crucial thing to, to put into the picture. So supermarkets and actually their predecessors have actually been around a lot longer than we tend to think. So the first was called economy grocery. Um, which just means um, somebody didn't go and get your food for you. You actually picked up your own food. That was the big innovation. 1912. But A&P, Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, had been around since the 1860s as a chain. You know, as a chain. So that, that is not that new. But the grocery was new. And then um, very shortly thereafter, the Piggly Wiggly um, in Memphis 
um, which and their innovation was not only did you pick the stuff off the shelves, but um, you had to do the the maze, right? To go all the way, so you had to look at everything on on the way, which was designed to make you shop more and to put more stuff in your basket. You wouldn't just go in and say, "I know I want this," and give it to me. But it's like, "Ooh, look at that! I'll take one of those too." So that was a um, you know kind of merchandising um, psychology. Um, but so so this has been around longer than we think. But also that sort of ecology of smaller stores, what we think of as mom and pops or specialty stores. So the, the butchers, the, um, the fishmongers, the, the market gardens. Um, and I just I put this in because when I first moved to this area in the early 1980s, I moved to Jamaica Plain and Kennedy's Butter and Eggs was still there. And I remember thinking what an amazing kind of old fashioned place that was. And that was a chain. Did anybody know Kennedy's? Any, Kennedy? Did you really? And, and, that's amazing. That's great, and and it lasted till two thousand. I was I was astonished to to hear that. I moved out a long time ago, but um, but that so that you know, and there, that's not the only kind of small small scale marketer that um, that persisted. Um, and there was home milk delivery in a lot of places till you know the nineteen sixties. I don't know does anybody know sixties? Yeah, anybody know any later than that? I'm thinking seventies. Exactly, exactly. So there's been a gap, but then that's, we're back to, to home delivery. Really interesting. Um, and then specialty items. So things like Thanksgiving turkeys tended to be something that small farms would specialize in. They, you know, like the Blue Hubbard squash, they would just sort of grow their 5,000 turkeys or whatever, and that would be their, their thing that they, they did for the year. So there was still um, all of that, even alongside the, um, the supermarket economy. But I think really by the 70s, certainly by the 80s, you're starting to see supermarkets become the norm. Um, but it's not that long ago. It's like really, we, 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 it's so normal now and it's so conditions everything we think about convenience and choice and seasonality, but it's, it really is not, they have not been that dominant for that long, which I think is an important point. Um, so, and the big shift um, really didn't come until um, after World War II. So this, um, this was a little obviously before the war, um, this, the first all-in-one grocery, meaning the first person who said, well, what if we actually brought the butcher and the um, grocer and the fishmonger and, and like put it all under one roof? That was his, um, his innovation, uh, this fellow in, in Queens. So he invented this and um, launched it in the 1930s. It kind of had to wait out the Depression and the war, but then that became the model, the post-war model um, of how we, uh, we shop. So um, that was, and after the war, of course, you've got the interstate highway system, right? long distance trucking, uh, the ability to, to source year round um, and, and stock a place like this. And, and then that sort of leads to this crazy abundance and, um, and kind of choice year round and get whatever we want any time of the, of the year. I was just in Wilson's farm on the way up here. And, and, and Wilson's, which is amazing. I mean, in some ways, is the kind of the inheritor of the, the New England market garden. But they've got asparagus from Peru, <laughs> even, even Wilson's. So, you know, they're, they, because they have to, they're, they're big and they want to compete with a supermarket where you can get asparagus year round. So if Wilson's wants to stay Wilson's, it's got to, it feels it's, it's got to do that. Absolutely. So refrigeration, um, and refrigeration goes back a long way because of ice, like insulated, you know, ice railway cars, but refrigerated long distance trucking, you know, that, that combination that lets the supermarket source um, is the, is the key one. Um, and so then you get this sort of gradual consolidation of stores, and which and probably everybody here can think of you know one chain that's bought another chain, right? Um, it's amazing how rapidly that happens and and how consolidated it's getting. Um, pretty soon Amazon is just going to deliver everything to us by drone, and it's going to be very simple. So and when you think about the um, you know this this innovation, the, the all in one, the innovation that you would get your own groceries, so they didn't have to have staff. Right, that was how they saved. That was how they, they, you know, they cut the jobs, <laughs> and you would basically do some of what had been somebody else's labor. Now it's Amazon, right? You go in with it, the, these experimental stores where you're, it's your phone, and they, they kind of read on your phone what you've picked up, and you, there's no person, and you just kind of walk out, and you know, it's mechanization and and kind of getting rid of the human labor and cutting the costs that way. So, um, so we're now in this really global um, global era of inventories and systems that are so big that a little farm can't plug into them. And that's the, um, the challenge that even though little farms sometimes would like to sell to market basket or a, a regional chain, they can't 
because there's no way to take a tiny amount of something, relatively tiny, and put it into a system that's only geared for these very giant flows. Um, so these two things have just become um, really incompatible. Um, so, but the 1950s really is kind of that era, the, the, the era when this farm um, really stopped being kind of a working commercial farm, shifted into pick your own fruit, which is a fairly common strategy, especially for orchards, for fruit farms, um, to keep a farm alive. Um, but that was the, when a, a farm of this size really could not play in the kind of the real food economy at that point, just, just couldn't, it just was incompatible. So even a successful market farm like this one, because this was a very, very um, prosperous, successful, smart, adaptive farm, and they hit that point, um, it, both in terms of the available labor, the, the family had moved away, and, and then the, um, the available markets just kind of um, squeezed them out. Um, so... All right, so those are kind of those three, three points. So let me just sort of um, throw out a question to you, and then we can just kind of open it up. But So we have this farm. This is an exceptional survivor, I think. Uh, really is. And it really has, you know, the, the, pick, the pick your own, the raspberry years, and then kind of over into the town ownership and the, the saving of the farm has um, really kind of kept this thread from snapping. It's, that's, that's the really exceptional thing about it. Um, so it's now... Um, existing as a historic site, an educational site, and as a farm within this whole set of questions about how do we improve our food system? How do we, what are we, what are we going to do with our, you know, kind of our local food system, local, local food since 1638. <laughs> there, you've got that continuity, but what does local food mean today? All food used to be local food, and how do we kind of reconfigure that today? Um, so this just to me is an outstanding resource for, for thinking about that, and I don't, I don't have the answer for it. But what I'm curious to hear from you, and then we can kind of move on from there. So I've been telling a somewhat different story about farming in New England, and particularly, you know, kind of getting the supermarkets in there and kind of saying, we need to think about you know, what's happening in the real world out there and how that sits with the history of this farm. Um, and yet that's really different from what draws people to a site like Wright Lock in a lot of ways. I think we were often drawn to the beauty, the nostalgia, the the baby goats, the you know, the, the good food, the raspberries, the, the flowers. Um, so I'm curious just to hear how how did you respond to kind of hearing the story reframed this way? How would you um, how much tolerance do you think there is for people to use a site like this to pry open those kinds of questions? And kind of more you know critical questions or or questions that are um, not, not just about farming per se, but about the food system more, more broadly. Um, does that kind of add to or detract from the things that might draw us here? So we got one vote for adds to. Well, it's interesting. It's, and so I've done this work for the National Park Service, including looking at sites like presidential farms, you know, vast elite gentleman farmer <laughs> kinds of sites which are now national parks, which are another, it's another kind of arguably, you know, kind of an elite. And yet, a lot of them are preserved farms. Um, you know, Dwight Eisenhower's farm in the middle of the Gettysburg battlefield is still a farm. <laughs> They're still raising you know, bulls, which is what he, he raised there. Um, very masculine kind <laughs> of farm. Um, but it's still a farm. And, and so there's a, it's an interesting thing. You know, you, there, are, there are different ways to kind of preserve farms and keep them going. That's why I think it's exciting, you know, places like this that are nonprofits that have an educational mission they don't just have to survive as a farm, although they're, they're, they're trying to do that as well. But I think, um, so if the president of Raytheon were a gentleman farmer and really wanted to like farm that farm, that would be one thing. If he's not, then that's sad. That's right. Um, and Minuteman National Park tried to have something called Battle Road Farms that didn't quite take. And I don't know, they may get back to that at some point, but they've, you know, they've kind of put that back to... 1775 and, and are trying to at least make it look like it was farmed then. I haven't mentioned them, you're right. Um, and that's a part of the, um, you know, kind of the rediscovering, the, the revival of, of small-scale agriculture, although in some places those markets never went away. That's an important kind of facet of this. And a, and a part of that ecology, you know, kind of you talked about the old farming ecology where people would kind of buy from each other and be part of the same network and that that's yeah, a crucial part. And Wright Lock sells at farmers markets too. How many? Okay. All right. Yeah. So farmers markets, CSA shares, um, 
Boston Public Market, really, really interesting, um, trying to be a node for, you know, for the local farmers, as Quincy Market used to be before it became just essentially tourist site. That, I don't know about the Cape Cod one. There's, there's also was a state, um, state hospital out in Templeton near where I live as a gorgeous farm. I'm just always salivating to have somebody come in and <laughs> really farm that again. So she's saying that the, just, just to have a, um, a place where people can encounter what it is to grow, you know, see a seed grow to a plant or meet a goat or, or, or you know, exactly. So getting in touch with your food, and especially for kids, and that's often a large part of the rationale that, you know, kids need to know that. But, um, yeah, and that's, the, that's where history, the past is not the present, and in the present, most people don't grow their own food and are um, somewhat um, kind of distance. I'm just going to sort of pull people, because we talked about this with the staff, about how far back in our own families there's some farming. How many people are farmers themselves at the moment? Yeah. <laughs> at the moment, yeah, okay, so we've got a few people that are farm. yeah. Um, how many people's parents were farmers? Yeah, some kind, yeah. How many people's grandparents were farmers? Yeah. Great grandparents, okay. So you know, it's somewhere. It's not that far back in family memory for I think most of us, um, and yet we're not right engaged in it ourselves. So there's this sense of kind of reconnecting across a distance that, in some cases, is not that far. So yeah, they, they do. yep, they do. So, so we're talking about, you know, another facet of um, what's, what's been happening. I didn't really talk about this, but the, the, the price of food actually has been dropping very steadily. And the proportion, the percentage of our income that we spend for food has been going down historically. So it's actually very low right now. But the wealth gaps have also been widening. So there's more people who can't afford even, you know, kind of supermarket food, cheap supermarket food. Um, and so, yeah, so good CSA food, organic food is, is a luxury and then, and that sort of class division, which we feel in places like this, too, and, and in the food movement, and also in the museum world, by the way. It's a really interesting, like there's an interesting parallel there. They, they tend to be the same, um, same kind of groups. So um, there's some interesting research that says that um, that sort of wealth, um, that, you know, affluence is not the only factor that um, prompts people to shop at a farmer's market. There's a, a wider range of ways that people find their way in, and a lot of it's, you know, concern about health, concern about kids' health their kids' health, um, that people will find that, that that's worthwhile. Um, but it's a, it's a tricky question, it's a really, especially if you're a more affluent person telling a poorer person that you should pay more for your food. So the, um, where does race come into this? And, and I think you know, race and class and, and gender. All the, um, but that, that our food system, um, in a lot of ways, is just the history of the food system is kind of shot through with those inequalities, right, right from I mean, right from the beginning, we're talking about indigenous farmers, that people were farming this land who held it in common. And that's a really interesting thing. That, that start of that, that treadmill that, you know, like, we have to get more land, we have to have more growth, all of that, was from a system of land ownership that said everybody needed to own their own farm. Every boy needed to own it. It's like every son, you know, it was like these, these systems of land ownership and, and ways of thinking about land and real estate that were... Um, inherently, um, we now look at them and say they're inherently oppressive and hierarchical and, um, and, and set us on the road to where we are now with this sort of ever-widening gap. So that is, um, that's a part of, you know, what I've been trying to kind of weave back into that story. That's, that's a big part, um, and it's challenging to think how to, you know, kind of do that in a way that doesn't um, exclude farmers who are still farming in that mode and expecting, um, you know, kind of come out of that tradition. It's a, you know, a tradition of, of farming and thinking about land. And I think that's been the class divide that you feel in the, in the food movement. There's a wonderful film called Forgotten Farms. I don't know if anybody's seen that. It's about dairy farming in New England. And it's, it's saying, like, okay, there's the older dairy farm. Dairy farms are screaming, right? I mean, they're just, they're still going out of business to just like year to year. Um, and that's mostly older, mostly white, um, you know, kind of a working class, blue collar kind of way of farming. Um, and talking about trying to make some kind of common cause with what they call the kale farmers, but <laughs> kind of, you know, the food, food movement farmers, younger farmers, people getting in, people who are thinking more politically about that critique. Um, how do you bring those two things together? Because in some ways, 
if we're going to think about the food system as a whole, we've, we've got to deal with, you know, kind of that range of people that are in it, which is a challenge. So I don't think I answered your question, but it's, it's certainly, it, it, it certainly, I see that at the edge of kind of food movement talk as, as the thing that we've really got to figure out at this point. So that's that sort of shifty, layered, um, really tricky set, like what's perception, what's reality, what, you know, what's a real farm? How, because farms for a long time have been presenting themselves in a certain way and sometimes playing on the nostalgia or the image of the, the taciturn Yankee farmer, whatever. So, um, And then the other flip side of that, when you're talking about like people leaving the land, and this is true of a lot of um, southern, black southern farmers who, you know, left the land and, or were displaced often, but it's like, especially once small scale farmers started trying to compete with uh, farms that were getting bigger and bigger in these bigger economies of scale, it was a terrible, terrible life and a terrible way to make a living. And even those Yankee mill girls, they were thrilled to come to Lowell and work 12 hours a day in the mill because they knew they'd get paid at the end of it. And they had other people around, and they weren't isolated up on their farm on the hill. And it, so, it, it, the, you know, those hard scrabble farms, I, I don't want to romanticize them either. So that's some of the complexity of it. And I think some of the difficulty of seeing it, <laughs> you know, see, seeing farming and thinking about what farming is, it's a surprisingly shifting, um, you know, kind of target to, to look at. Um, and that's where I think that focusing through the stories of particular farms helps us at least to kind of ground it to ground that history in particular families or particular stories, but then to see it within the context of those bigger processes. It seems like a way to start to cut through the shadows a little bit and, um, and get to a little bit more of the, like, what was it really like to farm in a given time, and why was that so hard? Not, not just like farming was hard, but it was hard at those, that time period because you had to have money to be able to buy a delivery vehicle if you wanted to get your stuff down to, you know, to, to Quincy Market. And if you couldn't, then you were falling behind and you were working yourself to the bone and maybe you got So she's talking about the, you know, the incredible complexity and the range. And, and I would say variation from year to year because they're going to adapt, you know, literally to the, to the market continually. That to me, the bigger story there is just how adaptable farmers and especially farmers in this part of the world have always been. It's, all farmers have to be. They have to be nimble. It's one of the tragedies of farms that get so large that they can't be nimble. They're in such debt. They have such huge equipment. They have, you know, they're really sort of stuck at a scale where they can't adjust. And so that's, again, a, a thing. I think the New England farms give us an ability to, to show that farms are not static. Um, I've never dealt with anything as complex as agricultural history. I, I don't think there's a single statement you can make about farming that you don't immediately have to qualify three, three different ways, because it's, um, it, it, it's just a very, um, it's, it, sort of infinitely shifting and, and, and infinitely particular. You're right, particular soil, particular people, particular markets, particular crops. Yeah, good. So, um, so asking about policy in relation to this. So um, definitely, I, di I didn't talk about policy here, but that's, that's woven in. And I would say certainly from the 1860s, which is when the USDA was founded. The USDA was founded in the middle of the Civil War. Why might it have been founded in the middle of the Civil War? Does anybody know? That's right. They had been digging their heels in because they didn't want the federal government telling them how to farm. And so the moment they seceded, Abraham Lincoln founded this Department of Agriculture, in which we still have. So good. there's a historian back here. Yeah. Um, so, but even before then, you know, the state, the um, you know, government on various levels has always been very, very interested in agriculture. So really fascinating story. And it's a, it's a real dialogue. So the, um, the book that that Kim mentioned, which is really written for a museum audience. We have a whole chapter, since we are assuming not everybody's up on policy, agricultural <laughs> policy history, a chapter where we talk about kind of a primer in, in terms of the, the policies that have mattered. And we have a great interview with some, the last, the lone historian in the USDA, there's only one, and she has to bill herself as an economist. Uh, they, they don't want history in the USDA. <laughs> in fact, they're getting rid of all the researchers. They're going to kick them all out of Washington, D.C. and kind of farm them out to the sticks. They don't really want researchers anymore. Um, but anyway, we have an interview with her, and, and she's been kind of fighting the good fight for many years. And she's, she's talking about policy as a, um, 
a discussion about um, resources and what we're going to do with resources. Like she's got a li lovely kind of living sense of what policy is. It's not a dry kind of wonky thing, but a, um, a very fiercely fought dialogue that we've been having. So um, that's sort of a general answer. But but yes, it's, it's something we always have to ask questions about. And then ask questions about you know what kinds of policies enabled the building of highways and the subdividing of lands and the or the protection of the land, right? That there's um, the policy has played a, a really you know, essential role in a lot of what we think of as farming. Yeah. When did the U.S. start to export a lot of food? Um, and that's not something I know a lot about. Um, certainly, the food aid. If you're, are you thinking about selling it or or giving? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Where's our historian here? <laughs> Right. Yeah, I think I think our food system has always been much more global, certainly, you know, since the colonial era than we tend to think. We, we think of it as like starting really local and then kind of getting bigger over time. But it's um, col the colonial food systems and people have traced, you know, the circuits of sugar, particularly the sugar, coffee, chocolate, you know, coffee, fish. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That, that was the first reasons that the northern Europeans came here, right, was to, to, to get the fish. Yeah. Yeah. I see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think the answer to when did they start was always, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then it's kind of gone up and down. The aid question is a really interesting one, too, in terms of, because what was happening, this is the kind of the crazy paradox about our system. We have a feeling because there's hungry people and there's kind of lack that there's not enough food. That's often that's sort of the common sense thing. We actually we should grow more food, and there's a huge emphasis on increasing yields and stuff. We have too much food. We've been overproducing food. That's that pivotal moment, early 20th century. We actually it was more in balance. There was starting to be too much, but the government would kind of they'd take the extra grain, and the, you know it was it was able to they they could sort of adjust for it, but. Once they kind of pulled those controls off, and then certainly after the 1970s, there's too much food. And so food aid, and domestic and international actually, has, has been, we think of it as a way to help feed the hungry, and it's arguably just as much a dumping ground for surplus food, surplus commodity food. It's, it's totally counterintuitive to how we think about both the food, you know, the scarcity of food and, um, and what we do with aid. But then that becomes a political, you know, a, a real political um, strategy for, you know, fighting the Cold War with grain um, to, to keep communist revolutions from happening in places where people were hungry. So, yeah. And that really, the sort of, um, you could say, sort of partitioning land or, um, you know, kind of, enclosing land. I, th I think Philemon Wright is a really important piece of that story here, you know, because he, he really was, this, this, wasn't, this wasn't a big enough horizon. He, he was really looking to get a lot more land and, and, and did, and, um, you know, sort of went somewhere where the, that process was happening all over again. So that, that might be one way to do it, is just to sort of think about it as this cycle, this, this you know, continuing kind of um, an edge that's always kind of pushing outward. Um, now, determining that, doing that research is is a it's a very specialized skill set. It's not you know we, it's one thing to look through the deeds and it's very handy and you can they're complicated enough. But you've got like you've got documents you know Western written documents. But to um, to document indigenous uses of a place like this that far back is is really Recent. challenging. I would also do it in dialogue with people today with sort of native food sovereignty movements and I know the. Um, the Nipmuc uh, people down in Grafton are beginning to do, you know, kind of re reclaiming some native farming practices to, you know, kind of put that in, in dialogue with those kinds of efforts, which is kind of back to that, you know, how do we deal with those histories of oppression is to talk with people that are, that are really um, articulating that. So, then, okay, yeah, round of applause. Because we asked you at the beginning, what did you most want to know about right log um, farm history? And that it was kind of a tease because we, we weren't going to be able to address them all. But I'm hoping this goes on to be a, you know, sort of a dialogue um, around this farm's history. And, and that will help the farm and maybe me to, to think about the kinds of things that people are curious about. Um, so, yeah, this is just, I mean, really a beginning to thank you for coming to this session. I will um, we'll do a follow up email with some resources for you. Um, and, you know, if you have questions in the meanwhile, um, definitely either shoot me an email or shoot any of us at the farm. Um, and we'll make sure to kind of keep us all connected, keep this conversation going um, in whatever form 
it wants to take. It's been a great evening, and I just thank Kathy again for coming and giving a lovely talk. So. Oh,